we went to, I went to, graduated from Valley Forge Christian College. It's now called Valley Forge University. So anyways, it's a treat for me and my wife to really be back out here. And we're going to spend Monday here reminiscing about our years together long ago. Um, but me and my wife have been married 40 years, and we have 11 children and 27 grandchildren. And um, the church I pastor is Mercy Seat Christian Church in Milwaukee, and I've been pastoring there for 34 years. So from time to time, I think about, you know, if I didn't pastor, where would I go to church? Because as you know, the state of Christianity is really awful in America right now. And um, I get contacted by people from across the country who are looking for a good church. It's, it's really in a bad way. And so I want you to know how blessed you are, because like when I was listening to that sermon this morning, your pastor is one of the few men who I know, if I quit pastoring, I could actually sit under his ministry and his preaching. You have a gem here, and you should be thankful to God for it. Because my heart breaks for the church in America right now. It's really a sad state. So when you have a man like this, you need to thank God for him. And um, may he build a great thing amongst you all here. But, um, you know, when it comes to love, he was talking about love. I always tell people, you know, if you divorce the ethic of love from Scripture, from God's word and his law, you can use the ethic of love to justify anything, including two men or two women marrying. And because of what he was talking about this morning, because the church has redefined love and joined in the world's definition of love, the church in America, Christianity in America, is actually helping proliferate evil in our nation. When I realized that several years ago, it was a hard thing. And um, to see how the churchmen have so failed in our country that they're actually aiding and abetting the evil that's going on in our nation. So when you hear faithful preaching, it's a goodness to the heart. Um, the topic I'm talking to you about when it comes to the Magdeburg Confession, it comes under what's known as Reformation Resistance Theory or Protestant, uh, Protestant resistance theory. That's what scholars label it as. And um, I learned a long time ago that people love theory, but they hate application. <laughs> so, <laughs> and whenever I, I read these guys, these academics, because I've read a lot on Protestant resistance theory, I always laugh and I think to myself, it wasn't theory to them. <laughs> they actually lived it. They actually applied it in time and space. Uh, they suffered because of it. Some of them were killed and martyred because of it, because of the application of these needed principles. And it was all based, understand, in their love and fealty to Christ. That's why they were willing to suffer, take a stand. Our love for him and his word and law is what gives us the grit to stand against the evils, the idols, the tyrants of our day. And so I just want to share with you briefly about the story of Magdeburg, because the matter of resistance theory um, is so immense in the history of the church. It is the history of the church, confrontation with the state. It's gone on and on again. So there's no way I can do it other than to share this little part with you in hopes that it whets your appetite to study more and to look into history more regarding these matters. And so I hope it actually does that. So in April of 1550, the ministers of Magdeburg, Germany, issued their confession and defense of the pastors and other ministers of the Church of Magdeburg. It was signed by nine ministers, all nine pastors. There were nine different churches in the city of Magdeburg. Understand Magdeburg was a massively large city. It had 30,000 people. It had the biggest walls of any city in the entire empire, in all of Ger Germany. So this is the actual cover from the original 
1550 Magdeburg Confession. They called it the Confession and Defense because the ministers in Magdeburg were being attacked, strange as that may sound, right, <laughs> by all the other Christian churches in the area. Why were they being attacked? Because in 1546, Martin Luther died. And when Martin Luther died, um, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, he decided to make his move to crush the Protestant Reformation. God, by his providence, had preserved Martin Luther's life, which I'll talk about in a minute. And he had also, in his providence, kept Charles V from being able to destroy the Protestant Reformation early on, back in the early 1520s. He had troubles numerous times from the Muslims invading, and he had to fight battles there, and he was also had to fight a battle with another foreign nation. God used all that so that he couldn't focus on crushing the Protestant Reformation. So 1546 comes, and he's like, this is it. We're going to crush it now. So he issued his what's known as the Augsburg Interim. So the Augsburg Interim declared that all Protestant lands are to be brought under Roman Catholic rule, belief, and practice. There were some ministers and Christians who refused to go along with it. Some of them were actually killed. Some fled out of the country but there was only one city that actually stood in defiance of the emperor, and that was Magdeburg, Germany. It's the story of a city that defied an empire, and they won. So these three guys here, the one in the middle is Martin Luther. The one on that side is Peter Melanchthon, who was Martin Luther's, kind of the guy who took over after Martin. And this guy over here is Nicholas von Amsdorf. All three of them were best of friends. Nicholas von Amsdorf, who's the first signer of the Magdeburg Confession, um, he was with Luther at Wittenberg. He was with Luther when he posted his 95 theses. He was with Luther all the way on the trip to Worms, Germany, where he's tried as a notorious heretic, and all the way back from Germany, from uh, Worms, Germany. So, this guy here, Nicholas von Amsdorf, saw the interposition of the lesser authorities in 1521. Remember after Martin Luther was tried as a notorious heretic, he was able to go back to Wittenberg? And why was that? It was because he was under safe conduct of the emperor. When you're under the safe conduct of the emperor, it means the emperor cannot assault you, kill you, molest you in any way. He was able to come to Worms in order to defend his position unmolested. After the trial was over, there was still 14 days of safe conduct allotted to Martin Luther. So Martin Luther was therefore free to leave and go back to his hometown of Wittenberg which he knew then he would be arrested and put to death within the next month. Before he left, however, the Catholic hierarchy went to Charles V and they said to him, kill him now. Don't let him leave, kill him now. And Charles V responded by saying this, I will not blush like Sigismund. And what he was referring to was this guy here. He was the Holy Roman Emperor a hundred years earlier. And a hundred years earlier, remember John Huss? He was brought to Constance, Germany under safe conduct of the emperor, talking about Emperor Sigismund. And instead of Sigismund giving him safe conduct, when Huss arrived, he immediately arrested him because the Catholic hierarchy wanted him to threw him in a dungeon, deplorable conditions. He was in there for six months. He was brought out, given a kangaroo trial, and then burnt at the stake in Constance, Germany. That was the biggest black mark on Emperor Sigismund's entire career. 
Many of the Catholics hated him for it because he had given his word. So it was such a black mark on Sigismund that a hundred years later, when the Catholic hierarchy tells Charles V, kill Luther now, he responds and says, I will not blush like Sigismund. So understand this. If it had not been for the martyrdom of Huss a hundred years earlier, Martin Luther likely would have been put to death in 1521. And it shows us how God has different things for each of us, amen? You know, and he does. And we just have to be faithful and true to him with, ever, with whatever he has for us as individuals. Now this guy is Frederick the Wise, the elector of Saxony. When Luther was coming back through, back to Wittenberg, they had to go through the city of Eisenach, Germany. And when he was there in Eisenach, Germany, Nicholas von Amsdorf's with him, all of a sudden, Luther is attacked and taken away. It was a feigned abduction by this guy, Frederick the Wise. Frederick the Wise was the elector of Saxony. You have the emperor here, and there were seven men immediately under him. They were called electors. He was the elector of the region called Saxony in which Wittenberg resided. So he already knew of the order from the emperor that he was to arrest Luther and turn him over so he could be put to death. But instead of obeying the emperor, what he did is he feigned Luther's abduction and put him in the Wartburg Castle there in Eisenach. Luther was there for a year. People didn't know if he was alive or dead. And he spent his time there translating the New Testament into German. It actually gave the German people their first unified language as they had over 800 dialects before that. So they got a unified language from the Word of God in the midst of the inner position of a lesser authority. So understand this is all important to what's happening here with the production of the Magdeburg Confession. In 1521, Nicholas von Amsdorf saw the interposition of the lesser authority with his own eyes, the interposition of Frederick the Wise. And by the way, Nicholas von Amsdorf was thought very well of. Let me get this here. Nicholas von Amsdorf, and by the way, there are no pretty pictures of Nicholas von Amsdorf. <laughs> Whether he was young or old, the paintings we have, he looked awful. <laughs> so, um, in 1524, Martin Luther thought so highly of him. Magdeburg was the first city to embrace the Reformation. Luther said, we took it without firing a shot, just by being faithful to the word and gospel. And he thought so highly of von Amstorf, Luther put him in the pulpit there. Katie von Bora, by the way, who you may recall married Martin Luther. Before Martin Luther was anything to her, she told friends that there's only two men on the planet that she would consider marrying, and that was either Dr. Martin Luther or Nicholas von Amstorf. She thought highly of him also. He's actually buried at the Church of St. George in Eisenach, Germany. And um, Katie von Bora is buried in the church at Torgau, Germany. If you could ever go to Germany, you would love the history there. Um, you can do all the history of Protestantism the, regarding the Reformation. It is phenomenal. And um, my wife, I don't know what happened to her, but she was around here somewhere. And uh, she loved the trip we did. We spent three weeks over there. We went to Italy and saw all the early church stuff, had a reformed pastor who let us stay at his house, congregation of only 15 people. It's Italy. <laughs> so, and um, he was actually won to Christ um, by a missionary from America when he was a teenage boy. Phenomenal guy. Um, we brought him over here just to do a history on the Italian reformers. And when he told me that, when I was over there, the Italian reformers, I said, who were the Italian reformers? Because, <laughs> <You know? laughs> of course, they persecuted them so badly. Many of them were put to death or they fled 
But this brother, um, what he's done is he's gone to the Vatican. They have miles of tunnels underneath the Vatican filled with books, bookshelves. And he said they're very meticulous at recording everything, the Catholics are, including the heretics. And that's where he's gotten the writings of the Italian reformers, because they're all there. There was one work he couldn't get, and I went to the University of Chicago, because I live in Milwaukee, and was able to secure a work for him. It's funny how God brings us together, isn't it? And um, when we were going overseas for three weeks, me and my wife, because we delivered a copy of the first English translation of the Magdeburg Confession to the mayor of Magdeburg, we were going to cut off our Italian part of the trip because it's so expensive. So I just put out a thing asking anyone, does anyone know anyone who lives in Rome? And someone who knew someone who knew someone who knew <laughs> someone knew him. And he said, come on over, you can stay at our house. By the way, they say that all of us are only six people deep from meeting anybody on the planet. I don't know if it's true or not. But I made it to a guy in Italy in four. <laughs> so <laughs> worked out pretty good. And um, so he took us on a truly Christian trip while we were there of the history of early Christianity for a day, me and my wife. It was phenomenal. Again, the history over there is so rich. We went to the Czech Republic also, and we saw all the battlefield where Siska the one-eyed fought the Holy Roman Empire. Most people don't know that after Hus was killed, put to death, martyred, the Hussites fought a 15-year war with the um, Holy Roman Empire, and they won. And it was done under the leadership of a nobleman named Shishka the One-Eyed. Phenomenal history. And after 15 years of fighting, they won their freedom 100 years before everyone else from being under the, root, under the boot of Roman Catholicism. So these are important matters. If you learn about Shishka, it's tremendous. He was a Christian man. They have a museum in Tabor, which is about an hour south of Prague. These battles he fought were usually around Prague. Prague was, um, you know, when the battles were fought there, the first time the battle, the first battle took place, there was 40,000 Hussites and 125,000 men. Sigismund had 125,000 men. And the Hussites slaughtered them. So two and a half years later, um, Sigismund came back with 250,000 men. The Hussites still only had 40,000 men, and they slaughtered them. The Hussites won every battle. In the end, they won their freedom from Roman. It's a tremendous history and story. I know I'm switching what I'm supposed to be talking about. <laughs> but anyways, it's just a tremendous, tremendous history. The battles that were fought, he was one of the top guys, top military strategists the planet has ever seen, Shishka the one eye. And he was a Christian brother. Um, when me and my wife went there, I went up to the guy at the hotel when we got to Prague, and I said, where's the big statue of Shishka the One-Eyed sitting on his horse? Because I've done lectures off that, you know. And uh, he goes, who? <laughs> and I go, so he goes, well, there's this, there's this mall area about two miles away you can walk to. And so we walked there. He said, there's a big statue there. Maybe that's what you're looking for. Well, we got there, and there was a big statue of John Huss. Which, okay, that's cool. And I wish I could have spoke Czech when I was there. I could speak Czech. My heart was moved so deeply. They're a very secular nation, and yet they have, like I was never into architecture. I see the importance of architecture since going to Europe. They're all secular, rejected Christianity by and large, and they have Christian architecture all around them. And they know nothing about Christ and Christianity. And um, so, we, I walked up to some policemen, and I said, do you know where the statue is of Shishka the one-eyed sitting on his horse? And they're like, who? <laughs> so, <laughs> so me and my wife were all bummed out. We're like, man, how are we going to figure this out? So in the morning, I went up to the guy at the hotel. Of course, there's a new guy there, and he's sitting there writing something. And I walked up, and I said, 
do you know where the statue is of Jan Shishka sitting on his horse? And the guy didn't even look up. He just places his pen down, and then he puts his hands like this, and he looks up at me and he says, you Americans, you come here for food, for architecture, but you're the first one to ever ask me about my fellow countryman, Jan Shishka. <laughs> so, me and him were like, we still have each other's emails <laughs> connected right away. My wife walks away. She knows it's going to be a long conversation. <laughs> so we end up finding out how to get up to this statue, and you literally have to walk up a, a mountainside like two and a half miles. I was 53 at the time, and that's why I went when I was younger over to Europe. I said, I don't want to be one of these old people who doesn't make that trip, right? And, uh, oh, there's my wife back there. So anyways, um, when you come around the bend, after you, as you're walking up this thing, you see the statue. Now, I always pictured the statue about being 15 feet tall or something, you know? Maybe 20 at the street. The base of the thing is 35 feet tall. The statue itself is another 30-some feet tall. And you know who put it there? The communists. When the communists took over the Czech people, they wanted them to forget about Christianity. And part of doing that was to make a hero out of Jan Shishka and build this massive statue for him. And the communists are so stupid, they didn't realize that Jan Shishka had everything to do with Christianity. <laughs> you know, so. History is important. So anyways, I go running towards this statue. My wife's behind me, and I'm yelling over my shoulder, can you believe the size of this thing? And I'm running and running, and then there's steps that actually go up the base to the statue itself, and I'm yelling the whole time to her, and I come around the bend, I get up there, and here's like 15 or 20 Czech students, college students, all smoking dope. <laughs> And they're all looking because they've heard me yelling like, oh, it's a crazy American. You know? it's like, so anyways, I run up to them and I say, can you believe the size of it? <laughs> and um, you know, they're all just looking at me and they got a big kick out of how I pronounce Jan Shishka because I wasn't pronouncing it right and all that kind of stuff. And um, so I told them a story, my first story about Jan Shishka. And within five minutes, all the dope was put out and they're all gathered in around me. And my wife knew it was going to be another long conversation and walked up. And um, I was there with them for 45 minutes, and they were just spellbound. And they're like, you know more about our country than we know. They all spoke English because they were college students, so I was able to speak to them. And it was just a phenomenal time to point them to Christ and bring Christian history to them. It was a goodness. So anyways, Sigismund, was defeated by the Hussites. And um, so here we are, it's 1546, Melanchthon goes along with the interim, and Nicholas von Amsdorf doesn't. He takes the stand at Magdeburg. Um, and the reason they call it the confession and defense of the pastors is, is because most of the other evangelicals, that's what they were called then, opposed the Magdeburgers for what they were doing. And so they wrote the confession as a defense of not only of their faith, but also a defense of the actions of their magistrates. Even to this day, the few Lutheran scholars I've met who know about the Magdeburg Confession, when they write about them, they call them the radicals at Magdeburg. But here's what I found from every Lutheran person who's read the confession. They said, all my life I've been taught you always obey the civil authorities no matter what. I never knew there were Lutheran ministers who said otherwise. So it's had a huge impact. Matthew Harrison, he's the head of the um, uh, Missouri Synod of Lutheranism. He actually contacted me two weeks after we published this work, because this is the first English translation ever. And he wanted to order 15 copies because they were preparing a paper to deliver to Congress, standing against evil being done by that body of men. And he wanted all the men, the 15 men who were 
contributing to the paper they were writing to read the Magdeburg Confession before they wrote. I was like, you're not like most Lutherans, Matthew. <laughs> He's like, he goes, God's word speaks to every area of life. And I said, amen. And um, so he immediately became a proponent of getting word out about the Magdeburg Confession to Lutherans. And um, if you know anything about the Lutherans, they're kind of like the trees in Lord of the Rings. It takes them forever to do something. But once they do, they really pack a punch. And, um, and that's how the Lutherans really are. So I got to meet Matthew also when he came to Milwaukee, Matthew Harrison, their president. Um, he did a fundraiser in Milwaukee a couple years after that. So this is like 2015, 2016. And he asked me to come and bring the Magdeburg Confession. And I told him, well, I've published my work too. He said, bring it. And we set up the books. Hundreds of people were there, not one book sold before the thing. He asked me and my wife to sit at his table, and there was a state senator sitting there too, who I had been wanting to talk to about the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, talk about God's providence, right? And then to hear him talk about the Magdeburgers as a Lutheran was such a blessing to me. And when he was done, there wasn't a book left. They bought every single one. Um, so it's had a huge impact on the Lutherans, most people think that the doctrine of the lesser magistrate is a reformed doctrine, but it was actually first established by Lutheran ministers and then picked up from there by the reformers. Uh, Christopher Goodman, who was a protege in England of John Knox, of course, John Knox himself wrote the foremost treatise on the doctrine of the lesser magistrate in his 1558 appellation to the nobles of Scotland in which he cited over 70 passages of scripture to show that the doctrine is sound in the word of God. I view it as the foremost um, treatise ever written on the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. It's a phenomenal work. For those of you who don't know what the doctrine is, it's simply this. When the higher ranking civil authority makes unjust or immoral law, policy, or court opinion, the duty and right of the lesser authority is not to obey and if needed to actively resist the superior authority. So get that, when the superior authority does evil, acts lawlessly, the duty of the lesser authorities is not blithe compliance. It's what we call interposition. And they're to use their office, their lawful office, to stand in interposition between the tyrant superior authority and the, less, and the people who they want to oppress. Very important. So this doctrine was first formalized in the Magdeburg Confession. And um, oh, where should I go from here? Let's get back to our story. There's Sigismund. There's the Wartburg Castle. Me and Claire actually went there, too. Me and Claire are talkers. We like talking to people. It was the only time in our three-week trip when we were over there that it rained, and we got stuck in the gateway with about 200 other people because it was pouring out. And so we started talking to someone. We had a great class there, right, Clara? And it was funny because the people there like said the same thing the Czech people said. You know more about our country than we do. And they said, one of them said this to me. He said, you know, you talk like a Wittenberger. You should go over there and talk to them. And uh, we had already been to Wittenberg, and it's true. The impact Luther and those men had all those hundreds of years ago, I'm telling you, is still there in that city. It's pretty astounding. And even the other Germans view them as differently because they've held on to their Christian faith much more so than the rest of secular Germany. Um, that's Charles V when he got old. We all get old, right? <laughs> so, um, that's the Augsburg interim that he issued to bring all the Protestant lands back under Roman Catholic rule, practice, and belief. <sighs> this thing isn't working. Am I going the wrong way, or is this thing not working? Yeah. Okay, that's Von Amstorf when he's old. He actually did kind of look better when he was old than when he was young. Um, so Nicholas von Amstorf 
taught these magistrates from his pulpit for over 20 years. And so when Charles V was doing what he was doing, they immediately knew what their duty was. And they defied the, they defied the emperor. And Nicholas von Amsdorf and other men wrote the Magdeburg Confession in order to show from scripture and history that their magistrates were right to defy the emperor. They, um, the uh, work is now available in English. When I was preparing my work on the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, I kept running into scholars who would refer to the Magdeburg Confession as the first time the doctrine was ever formalized. It's seen in the Old Testament, it's seen in the New Testament, I'm talking about the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, interposition. It's also seen um, in non-Christian, non-Jewish nations showing that it's natural to man, it's seen throughout the history of Western civilization. Um, but this was the first time that Christian men formalized it and showed from scripture and history the truth of this doctrine. And then the other reformers furthered it from there. Knox, Goodman, Mornay, Beza, all wrote on the doctrine. And both John Knox and Theodore Beza referred to the Magdeburgers and gave honor to them for bringing the doctrine of the lesser magistrate first. There was a time when Knox was before Secretary of State for Queen Mary, a guy named William Maitland. And Maitland, he was defending his position, Knox was, of the lesser authorities and the people standing in defiance of evil from the superior civil authority. And Maitland responded and said, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who supports that. And John Knox actually produced the Magdeburg Confession laid it out before him. He went to the back and he looked at the names of the nine men signed on it and Maitland responded and said, men of no note. And Knox responded in good John Knox fashion and said, servants of God nonetheless. Theodore Beza thought so highly of the Magdeburgers. He wrote of them in his 1554 work on the matter of heretics. And when he published his magnum opus on the right of magistrates um, in the 1570s, he actually published the work first under the title of the Ministers of Magdeburg, Germany. Because if he would have took ownership for it at that time, he could have been put to death. He didn't assume authorship for it until several years later when it was safe for him to do so. So the Magdeburg Confession influenced these a men of the Reformed faith in a tremendous way. And they furthered the doctrine and made it more well known and added so much to it. There's John Knox. So a little bit of what they said in there. They said this doctrine which we hand down about the legitimate defense of the lower magistrate against a superior. So the Magdeburg Confession has three parts to it. The first part is just boilerplate Lutheran doctrine. In fact, their section on the justification by faith is probably the best description of justification by faith I've ever read. And I believe that had to do with the fact that they were under the pressure of persecution. That can act as a great crucible at times to really strengthen and lay out your thoughts. The second part of the, let me go back here. Oh, maybe I won't. The second part of the confession is this, and that's where they teach the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. And the third part is where they put out a warning to the people, and they t it's it's rich. Read the third part because you get to see what men are up against. And uh, Pastor Matt addressed it a little bit today. You become the bad guy. If you stand true to Christ and the rest of Christianity is faltering, you become the bad guy. And they, their writings on that are so, so good. 
But on the second part here, they said, we will give from our churches the greatest possible number of men who, if they are able to enjoy their own religion through you, will declare their obedience toward you in all owed and upright duties and loyalty without hypocrisy, perhaps more than all those whom you say are obedient to you. This is an important point. We're Christian people. We're good for society. We actually obey the laws of the land. We actually work hard and help the economy. And when civil authority abuses its authority, we are also a goodness to society. Because our love is to Christ first, we're willing to take suffering upon ourselves because our fealty is to him first. And that acts as a check against the evil of the, superior, of the, of the civil authority. It gives the civil authority an opportunity to notice their evil, their sin, and repent of it. And it also helps the whole of the culture not come under the draconian tyranny of the civil authorities. And that's what they're talking about here. They made it perfectly clear the only reason they weren't obeying is because he was going against what Christ commanded. And like in my talk this afternoon, I'll be talking about the two times that you can go against um, the civil authorities. One is when they make law contrary to the law and word of God, and the second is when they exceed the limits of their authority. So they called the idea that we're always to obey the civil authorities. You know, you've heard everybody tell you that for years. Romans 13, we always obey. They called that an invention of the devil. <laughs> I always like reading men from that era because they just talk like men. And, you know, they didn't try to pussyfoot around, you know, and be all concerned about offending anyone. They would just say things plainly enough. They said the magistrate is an ordinance of God for the honor to good works and a terror to evil works, Romans 13, they said. Therefore, when he begins to be a terror to good works and an honor to evil, there is no longer in him, because he does thus, the ordinance of God, but the ordinance of the devil. And he who resists such works does not resist the ordinance of God, but the ordinance of the devil. So God has a purpose for the civil authorities. It's to punish those who do wrong and to reward those who do good. But when they turn everything on its head and begin to punish those who do good and reward those who do evil, we have a duty to obey God rather than man. So when they say, if you block the door of an abortion clinic to keep a preborn baby from being murdered, you go off to jail, while the abortionist who actually ripped the child apart goes home after work and sips martinis by his fireplace. And that's where we're at in our country. Everything's been turned upside down. The churchmen did not respond to their lawlessness properly. I can give you a long list, starting with John MacArthur, who all condemned the rescue movement and those who interposed at the doors of the abortion clinics. Because of that, their lawlessness has grown. So now they come into John MacArthur's church. He had a little different response when it was his, his property, his person, being assaulted by the magistrates. They're there because we didn't take the pulpits and the Christians didn't take their evil to task long before this. They said, therefore, if now the leader or Caesar proceeds to such a height of insanity, only in that order of natural knowledge which governs the society of civil life in uprightness that he abolishes the law concerning marriages in all chastity and himself sets up a contrary law of roving unclean lusts to the effect that the wives and daughters of all men are to be prostituted and if he himself defends and prosecutes this law with force and arms so that certain death is laid down as the penalty for those who resist or fail to conform, in such a case, doubtless, no clear-thinking person would have any hesitation about the divine right and commandment that such a leader or monarch ought to be curbed by everyone in his most wicked attempt, even by the lowest of the lowest magistrates, with whatever power they have. The lowest of the lowest would be like policemen in our day. Okay, they proffered this as an example because they showed that there's four levels of tyranny. 
And the first one is you just appeal to the authorities. We forbear, right? We try to forbear when we can. We should anyway. And we try to correct wrongs. They go through the four levels. The fourth level demands immediate interposition. The evil is so horrendous, it must be stopped immediately. You know, like murder, like murdering the preborn, or like homosexual marriage. They didn't proffer homosexual marriage as an example because it would have been completely foreign to the minds of people back then. So they use this example. The civil authority says your wife and your daughters can be used as prostitutes, right? What is the duty of the lesser authorities? To obey the king? To obey the superior authority? Or to interpose and stand in defiance of what they're doing? That's the example they use, and I thought it was kind of <coughs> prophetic that they used an example about marriage, given the state of a marriage in America today, where we even have so-called homosexual marriage. They said, this is being done by our highest magistrates. They are attempting to abolish by force the true knowledge of God among us and all men for all posterity. And that's exactly what's going on today in America. The magistrates are doing the very same thing. And think about it. The churchmen have aided and abetted them in accomplishing their evil. You have to understand 95% of churches in America closed their doors when the quote-unquote pandemic took place. Not only did they close their doors, but thousands of them took money from the federal tyrant. Over $12 billion has gone to Christian churches and Christian organizations who closed down and then when they reopened, followed masking six feet apart, putting a little slimy stuff on your fingers, they actually not only played the traitor, but they played the prostitute. I'm talking about the churchmen. And if you know anything about the history of the churchmen, the history of the churchmen is they'll block the door to keep the state out. Now the state's blocking the door to keep the churchmen out, and they comply, and then they take money to get rewarded by the tyrant. I already knew American Christianity was in a bad state of affairs. I had no idea how really bad it was till this all happened. I've wept for our nation and for the church more times in the last two years than I have in the last 20 years before that. They said in their thing, we are not swayed by the majesty or wealth of anyone. They were talking to the emperor. This is, they sent this to the emperor. <laughs> you know, said they, it wasn't just to be put on a shelf in their church building. They sent this to the emperor. We are not swayed by the majesty or wealth of anyone. I love that line, and I'll tell you why. Because so many in America are swayed by the wealth and majesty of anyone. <laughs> so I always tell people I'd rather be where we're at in America now than where we were two, and, two years and three months ago before all this started. And the reason is, is because I'm 61 years old and I watched our nation going like this, drunk on their wealth and ease, even the Christians. And this caused a change. People were alarmed. There was some repentance. It's been small, no run on sackcloth and ashes down at the Ace Hardware. But I saw repentance, people deepening their walk with the Lord. We saw four people come to Christ who we were engaged with precisely because of this, um, because of the pandemic, and me speaking out against the draconian decrees of the state regarding it. They said this, divine laws necessarily trump human ones. <laughs> so God's law is the objective standard to which all men and all governments of men are accountable. <coughs> You do understand that, right? God has established three great governments, family government, church government, civil government. They're meant to produce within the individual the fourth great government, which is self-government. Within each of the three great governments, you have um, positions of authority. All the four great governments have their own roles, functions, duties, and limits. 
when it comes to the civil authorities, um, the authority that anyone possesses within any of those great governments is what we call delegated authority. In other words, they get their authority from God. Pastor Matt mentioned that in his sermon too. So when the civil authorities are delegated authority from God, they have a duty to govern according to his rule. John of Salisbury, who wrote Polycraticus, defined a tyrant as someone who, as a civil magistrate who no longer follows the law of God. He's made himself a tyrant. He's introduced tyranny into the land. Most people know nothing of this. We have to bring this to people. This thinking has to be brought to the churchmen, to the magistrates, and the people of America. Not every last person. That isn't going to happen. But to people. We have to bring it to them. Here's what I've learned about the culture. Most people, I'm talking about 85% of people, will always only care about three things in life. Me, myself, and I. That's all they'll ever care about. It's about 15% of the people who determine public policy in a nation, whether for good or for evil. And it's important that we as Christian people speak to civil government matters because God's word speaks to all matters of life, including civil government matters. And because Christians have abandoned the realm of civil government, wicked men have filled the void and made their worldview law, policy, and court opinion. And as you can see, it's not gone good. It's a complete insane asylum at this point. So divine laws necessarily trump human ones. His law is the higher law to which all men and all governments of men are accountable. 